Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, which I saw at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden. The conductor was Alexander Saudi. The production was done by Yuval Sharon. The sets were done by Mimi Lien and Marc Lehrer. The costumes were done by Walter von Bayerndonk. The lights were handled by Reinhard Traub. The videos were done by Hanna Vasilevsky. The sounds were done by Markus Böhm. And the chorus master was Anna Milukova. I was initially apprehensive when coming into this production of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte done by Yuval Sharon because I did hear a lot of bad press about this. Plus, it looked really, really kitschy in my eyes, especially when I start talking about the production and the costumes. However, I still soldiered on because at least it presented a very fine cast, especially when one has René Pape as Zarastro and Albina Shagimuratova as the Queen of the Night. I will gladly talk about the singers much later in this review, but first, of course, the production and costumes. As I stated before, my overall thoughts on the production and costumes was they were all extremely kitschy. They had this certain corniness about them. And it also doesn't help matters that Tamino is dressed up to be a marionette version of Astro Boy. Speaking of marionettes, the characters in this opera are all marionettes tied with Velcro harnesses to make them fly around the stage, much like the marionettes do in real life, handled by their puppeteers, which I thought was a really cool effect. And it did make me enjoy seeing all those flying movements both the acrobatists and the singers managed to do. And I definitely enjoyed that particular aspect about this production. Mind you, that is the only aspect about Yuval Sharon's production of Magic Flute that I enjoyed the most. The other facets kind of fell flat on their faces. If this particular production is supposed to be directed to kids and even audiences who are younger than 13 or even below their teens in general, then why on earth do we have to see the three ladies all conjoined and having breasts everywhere, complete with the nipples. That to me just seemed really confusing, as if to say that the people behind this production highly believe they can get away with almost anything. At least they kind of have the balls to do it, but still, it makes me kind of confused as to what this particular production is intended for. Is it intended for kids because of the simplistic designs of the outfits and the scenery and the whole concept of having the characters as marionettes? Or is it also supposed to be for adults because of the three ladies grotesque looking costume or even that of Papageno's three jokes involving German wordplay? And going to the other costumes, Pamina is essentially a girl version of what would happen if Astro Boy and Pinocchio were to end up having a fusion dance. And here she was as the female version. And on top of that, Monostatos is essentially what would happen if Minnie Mouse were to have a lot of lovemaking with not only Mickey Mouse, but also R2-D2, Darth Vader, and the Shredder from Disney, Star Wars, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, respectively. Let that sink in, people. Let that sink in. I mean, it was rather cute and funny and kind of enjoyable at best, but simultaneously, it was kind of jarring in the more serious moments, especially when we have Tamino and Pamina in the trial of fire and water, and we see them in a kitchen, rid of their strings, and trying to behave like a normal everyday couple, with Pamina doing the cooking, and Tamino trying to see if the lighter works so that they can start cooking and preparing their meal, which made me think that that's a typical scenario 
for a certain romantic comedy or even a sitcom involving a couple doing everyday things rather than that particular test that both Pamino and Pamina have to go through. Speaking of jarring, instead of having a majority of the singers speak their own lines, their speaking voices in the dialogues ended up being dubbed by children with the exception of Papageno. That to me sounded rather unusual, if not kind of creepy and weird, because why on earth would you give Tamino the voice of a prepubescent boy when he is speaking, and at the same time, you have a tenor singing his arias and the many other scenes he has to sing. The same thing I can say about the other characters, such as Monostatos, Pamina, the three ladies, and of course the two priests. At least with the Queen of the Knights case, she has a more mature sounding woman voice to dub her speaking lines. And with Papageno, he was at least spoken by the main actor slash singer of the evening. So overall, I had extremely, extremely mixed feelings about this particular production of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte. On the one hand, it was kind of cute and enjoyable seeing all these characters in different costumes that have a lot of pop culture importance to it, such as Tamino being a hybrid of Astro Boy and Pinocchio, and Monostatos being a huge hybrid between Mickey Mouse, Darth Vader, the Shredder, and R2-D2, and Pamina being a girl version of Pinocchio and Astro Boy. And of course, that one scene with Tamino and Papageno falling down, which is extremely reminiscent of Alice in Wonderland falling down the rabbit hole. But there were other discrepancies that kind of made me scratch my head, such as the grotesque design of the three ladies' costume when they were about to rescue Tamino from the serpent and when they were about to invade Sarastro's domain. And the overall look and feel of this production was pretty much bereft of the gravitas the elegance, the pomp, the beauty, and the majesty of many a traditional production of Magic Flute. In short, I was not completely impressed, but at least it was kind of enjoyable in its own way. Even with all of the discrepancies and even with all of the questionable costume choices and even the equally questionable pop culture references reflected on those said costumes and scenery and the most questionable choice of having a majority of the characters having their spoken lines dubbed by children which was something that was kind of a turnoff for me because I would have loved to hear Julien Pregardien's speaking voice when he was supposed to be acting his lines as Tamino or many of the other singers. In fact, the only moment in which Pamina was able to speak in her own voice was probably because it was meant to show that she doesn't want to be a puppet anymore, but she wants to be a real girl which I thought was an interesting move as it did break the convention of this production. So, as I stated before, not a fan, but at least it had some pretty fun moments. And now we get to the singers, the very part of this review I am most excited to talk about. We now start off with Tamino, sung by Julian Pregardien. And I was quite fascinated with how he was able to sing the role of Tamino. He does have a pretty good voice, especially when he has to sing all of his lines so well, both the high and the low notes, he definitely had a good technique worthy of further development, further growth, and loads of potential to be a lot more awesome than it already is. Sure, there were times that he sang in the mask, even though he should end up singing more in the pharynx and make every single moment of his voice 
be pharyngeal. But from what I can hear in his voice, he does have amazing material to work off of. And he also has a fine and dashing stage presence, even if he ended up having to be in that Astro Boy slash Pinocchio getup. Nonetheless, he definitely showed some fine musical prowess. I would love to see him continue in his growth as a singing actor. And he has a lot of potential to especially sing a lot more French and Italian roles, such as Tonio from La Fille du Regiment, Edgardo from Lucia de la Marmour, Hoffman from Le Comte Hoffman, and many other great roles for a lyric tenor. He deserves the best in his career, and I would love to see him develop his voice in the right way, which means more pharyngeal singing, more great coordination between head voice and chest voice, and an overall more improved technique and an overall more improved technique from this fine tenor who has a lot to give to the world. The only performer who left quite a dent in vocalism was Florian Teichmeister as Papageno. Sure, when the opera premiered back in 1791, Emanuel Schikaneda was also an actor, but one should not forget that he was also the librettist, which meant that he knew how the music was going to sound, and he had a clue of how each and every character was going to sound in terms of their voices, and he also collaborated with Mozart on that. With Florian Teichmeister, even though I did enjoy his charisma as Papageno and the dedication he had as an actor who threw himself in to Papageno's shoes rather well in terms of giving him his bubbly nature and how he was able to make him humorous and make him lively and full of the joie de vivre that one would associate in Papageno. I was not crazy about how he sang or more appropriately crooned his singing lines, which was a huge shame because every time he crooned, it made me realize just how much his voice ends up disappearing and drowning from the orchestra. Try as he might to sing with much more power in certain moments and much more passion, but that voice to me ended up drowning out in terms of the necessary support, the coordination that it needs when singing, and the overall basics when producing a clear, clean, and well-produced tone. I get that he's mainly a stage actor, but even stage actors need to have a lot more declamation, well-coordinated chest tones, and clear vowels when they deliver their lines on stage and even their big monologues. With Florian Teichmeister, sure, he was able to do a fine job in the dialogues, but when it comes to singing, I felt like it was kind of a discrepancy, which is a huge shame because I do feel that he could have ended up giving a lot more to his voice, like giving a lot more coordination between head voice and chest voice, giving a lot more power and oomph to his said voice, and not allowing his voice to end up drowning out from the orchestra. It literally says something when even singers such as Dietrich Fischer-Dieskau, Hermann Prey, and even a much better example in the forms of Erich Kunz, and Giuseppe Taddei could produce richer, fuller, and more coordinated tones than Florian Teichmeister ever could. It's just a shame that his voice could have used a whole lot more support, a whole lot more coordination, and most of all, a whole lot more declamation in singing his arias, and his lines. And as I stated before, before any of you start typing to me saying that, oh, he's just a stage actor, so he doesn't need that much experience in singing. Let me tell you right here that stage acting also requires as much voice and as much power as much as it needs in opera singing. It should be declamatory. 
it should have a lot of presence. It should have a lot of core and strength. And while his dialogue scenes did have sufficient core, I felt like that core should have also been used in singing. Heck, we could have even gotten ourselves some real baritones to sing Papageno in the forms of, for example, Artu Kataya, Roderick Williams, and many other good baritones today who could have ended up singing Papageno. Regardless of my sentiments of Florian Teichmeister, at least he was brave enough to tackle this part, which was saying something, considering how much effort he needed to carry a tune all throughout the evening. And for the record, Mr. Teichmeister is not the one to be blamed. Someone hired him. Someone thought that he could be able to relive the Emanuel Chicaneda tradition of having an actor singing Papageno without even realizing that the role must be sung and not crooned. That means having great head voice and chest voice coordination and of course, total declamation. So it was still kind of a serviceable job that Florian Teichmeister did as Papageno, though I do wish we could have had a real baritone singing this role. Then we have Pamina, who was sung by Serena Saenz, and she had a lovely voice. She has clarity, she has sweetness, and she had a certain bell-like quality to her voice that made me realize that there is a lyric soprano hiding in that young woman's voice that needs to emerge a lot more and that needs a whole lot of further development. She managed to sing her lines well. However, there were times that her head voice did go on the collapsed side, which was a shame because Serena Sayenth does have pretty good material to work off of, especially considering that she has not only sung roles like Pamina, but also has a lot of potential to sing roles such as Gilda from Rigoletto, Antonia from Le Conte of Man, Melisande from Peleas et Melisande, Eudoxy from La Juive, Berthe from Le Prophète, Adina from L'Elisir d'Amore, Norina from Don Pasquale, Musetta from La Boheme, Lauretta from Gianni Schicchi, and maybe even Lucia de Lemermur by Donizetti. The future for this young soprano does seem to have a lot of promise, just as long as she is able to develop her voice in the right way. That means a lot more coordination between head voice and chest voice, a more ironed out technique that can be able to be harmonious all throughout the registers, and of course, never giving in to mediocrity, nor constantly trying to lighten her voice to make it sound quote unquote pretty. Victoria Randem was absolutely charming as Papagena. Even though her role was rather small, her lovely stage presence, her girlish features, that sunny attitude that she brought to this role, and her lovely, silvery, and sweet voice that she was able to offer as Papagena were her absolute assets. Moreover, this is a young soprano I would love to see tackle roles such as Pamina, from this very opera, Susanna from Le Nozze di Figaro, Serlina from Don Giovanni, Servilia from La Clemenza di Tito, Ilia from Idomeneo, Norina from Don Pasquale, Gilda from Rigoletto, Oscar from Un Ballo in Maschera, Nanetta from Falstaff, and many other fine roles for a light lyric soprano. She definitely has a great future ahead of her, and I would love to see her grow in the right way because she's got a lot of brilliance to show and she is a young talent who is on the cusp of a fine international career. Rene Papa is certainly no stranger when it comes to singing and interpreting the role of Zarastro, a role that he has been performing for, I would say, 20 plus years. He continues to have the tall 
and masculine stage presence and even that fatherly stoic presence that is needed for Sarastro. He was an absolutely dedicated singing actor who was able to give the goods when it comes to this role. However, if ever I were to compare René Papa to let's say a lot of the great bossos of the past who have also specialized as Sarastro, whether they be Ezio Pinza, Alexander Kipnis, Herbert Alzen, Gottlob Frick, Kurt Burma, Cesare Sieppi, Giorgio Tozzi, Jerome Hines, Evgeny Nesterenko, Marti Tovola, and even Robert Lloyd in his prime, René Papa kind of falls short because his voice, while it does have a fair amount of plushness and a fair amount of dignity to be heard in that role, I felt like he was lacking in that extra meat and that extra amount of darkness, depth, and an extra cavernous quality to his voice that would make any great Sarastro and even give a strong impression of this iconic priest. Regardless of that gripe, I still have to give René Papa a lot of credit for what he was able to do as a hard-working singing actor. He was able to continue to embody Sarastro with a lot of dignity and a lot of virility, which made him stand out rather well. Albina Shagimuratova was in absolutely fine form as the Queen of the Night, a role that she has been singing for many years. I was thoroughly impressed with the clarity she had in terms of her two iconic arias, she was able to sing those high notes really well, and she had a generally plush and fierce timbre, which makes her voice quite ideal for the Queen of the Night. However, if you were to ask me who is supposedly the complete package when it comes to the Queen of the Night, I would still go out of my way and say Christina Dortakom, because she had everything. She had the high notes, she had the low notes, and she generally had a very well-coordinated voice which managed to show power, clarity, and strength in all the registers. With Albina Shegemuratova, while she did have that power and that fierceness, I felt like she was kind of lacking in the low notes, especially in the second Verstossen, Verlassen, Unzertrömmert lines, in which those final syllables need to have those low notes being sung and not just faded away. I say this because Albina Shagimuratova gives me a lot of hope that there is going to be a great surge of dramatic coloratura sopranos. We already have great ones such as Clara Kolonitz gracing the stage, and even Jessica Pratt, who is also balancing lyric coloratura soprano roles and dramatic coloratura soprano roles. With great aplomb, with Albina Shagimratova, I could definitely see a great future in a lot of more dramatic coloratura soprano parts, such as the three Donizetti queens, namely Anna Bolena, Maria Estuarda, and Elisabetta from Roberto de Vereux, Beatrice di Tenda, Beatrice di Tenda by Bellini, Imogene from Il Pirata, also by Bellini, and even that of Matilde and Norma from Guillaume Tell, and of course, Norma, respectively. So once she is able to develop those chest tones and make them a lot richer, rounder, far more pronounced, as well as combine the power from the low notes with the high notes very well, I'm pretty sure we could have a great dramatic coloratura soprano we can call our own. She's already conquered the likes of not only the Queen of the Night, but also Constanza and Semiramide. So I'm pretty sure that if she continues to develop her voice in the right way, and even take some tips and tricks from the great Christina Dortakom, we will definitely have a fine dramatic coloratura soprano 
who can be able to sing all of those great roles, especially such as Luisa Miller, Giselda, Elvira from Hernani, Elena from Ives Siciliani, Isabel from Robert Le Diable, and Marguerite de Valois from Les Huguenots. The future is definitely promising for Albina Shagunratova in terms of how much material she's going to work off of, and I cannot wait to see just how beautifully and how strongly her career will end up developing. Florian Hoffmann was absolutely fun and quite menacing as Monostatos. With his fine character tenor voice and that flexibility and agility that I could hear in his voice and that flexibility I could hear in his voice, he was able to do quite a fine job in this particular role. He brought in character, charisma, and charm to an otherwise despicable more, and he did it with a plumb. And he did it very well. We even had such equally wonderful singing to be found in the three ladies in the forms of Adriana Queiroz's gorgeous, lovely, full lyric soprano voice which was complete and even all the way through. Natalia Skritska's sparky and really fine second lady whose lyric mezzo voice definitely has a lot of potential to grow, especially with those chest tones. Constanza Hella's equally charismatic and lovely third lady whose mezzo-soprano voice was quite well produced, though it could Though it could benefit a lot more with more coordinated chest tones and a lot and an even cleaner technique. Ostrek, who was able to sing the role of the speaker as well and the priests with a fine amount of dignity, charm, and beauty, even though I would love to hear and see him develop his lower register a lot more and keep on strengthening that, keep on beefing that up with all those chest tones so that he could be able to sing not only the bass baritone parts, but also the basso cantante parts because he definitely has a lot of great material to work off of, and I do not want to see him squander his talent. And I certainly cannot wait to see what else the future is going to offer him in terms of bigger roles. And even Andres Moreno Garcia, who also sang one of the priests, as he had an absolutely luscious, handsome, finely tuned, and gorgeous tone which he was able to emit with a plumb beauty and loads of wonderful lyricism jun sang han and frederick yost who were able to combine their voices so well as the two armed men what with jun sang hang having this gorgeous focus and absolutely beautiful sounding full lyric tenor voice combining it so well with Frederick Yost's fine bass baritone voice which has a lot of potential to keep on beefing up in the lower register and beefing up those chest tones so that he can be able to be as great as a singer as he will be in the future and of course some equally lovely and delightful singing from the members of the Tauza Knabenkwas, who were able to sing the roles of the three boys rather well, even though there were times they did go flat in some areas. Regardless, they were able to work well with each other, and I can definitely tell that they certainly had a lot of fun with this particular production of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte. So overall, the singing was rather decent. Standing out rather well were René Pape and Albina Shagimuratova as Zarastro and the Queen of the Night respectively. Those two were veterans of these roles and they were able to do fine jobs with them and I would love to see them keep on developing the right 
way with the right technique. And yes, even though Florian Teichmeister was kind of the low point in terms of singing, he was able to enjoy the role of Papageno and find certain facets about him that make him fun and jolly. And lest I forget about the equally fine singing to be accomplished by Julian Pregardien, Serena Saez, and Victoria Randem, and everyone else involved, they were able to do such a great collaborative effort that I have to salute each and every one of them for doing everything they can and giving it their all. And the conducting done by Alexander Saudi was decent at times. Sure, there were times that the tempi were too fast for my liking, especially in the more solemn and more reflective moments such as the solemn parts of the overture and even the march of the priests oh unless i forget about soll ich dich teurer nicht mehr sehen the trio between zarastro tamino and pamina in the second act and yes there were also times that the singers could not catch up to alexander Sadi's speed but regardless of those issues he was still able to lead the orchestra pretty well when it comes to certain moments, such as the Queen of the Night second act aria, Der Hölle Rache, in which he was able to lead the orchestra to give as much fierceness and fire as possible. And of course, the chorus, orchestra, and statistery of the Staatsoper Unter den Linden were absolutely fabulous all the way through. So overall, with a production I have extremely mixed feelings with, especially considering that it felt like one big pop culture parade, plus some fine collaborative efforts from the singers and the conductor and the chorus, orchestra, and statistery, this particular production of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte was solid all the way through, especially when you have such fine singers led by the likes of René Pape and Albina Shagumratova. And for those of you who saw this particular production of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden, what do you think of it? Do you feel that René Pape and Albina Shagumratova were able to steal the show as Zarastro and the Queen of the Night respectively? Did you have really mixed feelings about this production? Or did you like it? Did you love it? Or do you not love it at all? Or do you even hate it at worst? Did you feel that there was a singer who caught your eyes so much? Or did you feel like the singing was not particularly up to par? Comment below and let me know. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in next time for my review of Puccini's Turandot starring Alfred Kim as Kalaf. So until then, good night everybody.